good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is with us on WebEx and to who is now joining us on Facebook Live. The Geneva Environment Network and the International Union of Conservation of Nature have the pleasure to welcome you today virtually for a special session of the Geneva Dialogues on Nature-Based Solutions. Our event today is also held as a World Environment Day celebration, the official for the Geneva stakeholders. The theme of the day this year is ecosystems restoration. And as we are launching the United Nations Decade on Restoration on this occasion, this event is also officially part of the events of the decade. The event today is structured in two parts, a short welcome and introduction part focusing on the context of World Environment Day and the launch of the Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Our master of ceremony for that part is Bruno Pozzi, the director of the Europe Office of the United Nations Environment Programme. And the next part, we will discuss uh, the main subject of our session today, nature-based solutions and ecosystem restoration, including the possibility of bringing uh, your questions to our panelists. It's Marco uh, Valderabano from IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, who will guide you in the session. Indeed, our nature-based solutions journey is co-convened with IUCN. IUCN um, um, is, uh, is located not very far uh, from Geneva. It's part of the, 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 the great area of Geneva um, and is an essential global actor bringing together the world's uh, most influential organizations and experts to conserve nature and accelerate the transition to a sustainable world. We have again the pleasure to have some leading experts from their network with us today. As you will hear from our guests and from our moderators, the Nature-Based Solutions Dialogues aim to facilitate further engagement and discussion among the stakeholders in international Geneva and beyond in the lead up to critical year, a critical year for nature and society. Before I give the floor to Marcos as co-convener of the session, let me briefly mention for those who wouldn't yet know the Geneva Environment Network, that we are a network of more than 100 institutions and secretariats based in Geneva that make this region one of the global hubs for environmental governance. Administrated by the United Nations Environment Programme and supported by Switzerland, we organize various networking activities, including regular multi-stakeholder roundtables and briefings on major environmental trends. Let me also remind you that the documents presented today, the summary, as well as the video of the dialogue will be made available on the webpage of the event. Before Bruno Pozzi takes the floor for the official launch of the event, let me turn to Marcos, who is a program manager of the Red List of Ecosystem at IUCN, who will be completing this welcome message before we turn to Bruno and we'll later moderate the discussion as mentioned. Marcos, over to you. Thank you very much, Diana, and welcome everyone. As a co-host of uh, this uh, uh, Global Dialogue on Nature-Based Solutions, I want to welcome you all for this very special event uh, where we are gonna be talking at the same time about the launching of the UN Decade of Restoration or the World Environmental Day about how we connect the dots between restoration protection of the environment and nature-based solutions. As Diana, you were just mentioning, we're gonna have two main blocks in this um, webinar. First part with which Bruno will uh, moderate will be the opening remarks. And then we will move into a more thematic content going into the nuts and bolts of how, how we can make those connections between restoration and nature-based solutions. And for those of you that um, are courageous enough to stay with us until the end of the webinar, We'll have a surprise video uh, at the end um, and a session of questions where you can uh, interact with the panelists and ask uh, some questions and address those directly. So with further to do, I'm gonna give the floor to Bruno for the uh, official uh, opening on, on, of this webinar. And then I'll take it back to introduce our dear panelists and introduce briefly the topic. So over to you, Bruno. Thanks a lot, Marcos, and thanks, uh, Diana. Really a pleasure to be uh, with you today. On, on, as you just set the scene on, for a number of, 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 of occasions, of course, the World Environment Day, and usually we can see each other on a round table on the panel uh, at uh, La Maison de l'Environnement in, in Geneva, uh, uh, and we host a celebration together with our host country, with the Canton, with all stakeholders. We can't do it do it this year because of the 
sanitary uh, uh, situation. Uh, but but it is such a great opportunity to meet, to be with you, uh, all all colleagues uh, on the panel and all uh, uh, those online who follow this webinar to celebrate the environment. And we need to celebrate it because the environment is so much at the center of political and uh, social action nowadays. It is really part and parcel of uh, the future of humanity and and this is in this framework of course that we have also on top of the world environment day the launch of uh, the un decade uh, of ecosystems restoration uh, where we tend we want we we we, we are uh, uniting as united nation and as a, a movement of uh, of friends of nature to say enough is enough we must make peace with nature we must bring solutions that are based on nature to address the three crises that uh, our planet is facing biodiversity loss climate change and pollution and by doing this uh, by creating this movement of the un decade on ecosystems restoration which starts now and will last until 2030 uh, in in the same uh, decade of the acceleration of the sdgs we need to achieve the sdgs by 2030 well we we are calling for more action on nature and more action for people uh, 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 through nature uh, nature-based solution on the larger scale we make a difference in safeguarding safe security in procuring clean water and in uh, indeed as i was saying uh, bringing a solution or part of the solution to the three crises that we are facing so it's really this movement of civil society governments private sector uh, all together uh, to invest in healthy and strong ecosystems that we are uh, creating today to do this, we've got a very important uh, uh, panel and discussions ahead of us, so I won't be too long. We will start with opening remarks uh, uh, by uh, a number of, of colleagues and excellencies. And as it's the tradition, because we are hosted uh, by uh, Geneva, we are Dans la Genève Internationale and the Geneva Environment Network, as Diana has reminded us, is uh, supported by Switzerland. I've got the pleasure really to welcome our host country, represented by the head of the Federal Office for the Environment, uh, Catherine Schneeberger, uh, to do uh, a few opening remarks. Catherine, over to you. Thank you very much. Excellencies, dear friends, when I took office about one year ago, I realized immediately how interconnected environment policy is today. Many of our national action plans are rooted in international strategies. Geneva, Nairobi, Bonn, New York have become important hubs for my daily work as director of the Federal Office for Environment. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic still limits uh, physical meetings. I would have been keen to meet you in person, of course, to visit the International Environment House and all the institutions that take part in the Geneva Environment Network. But I am glad that we all learned to use video conferencing tools and appreciate that this online workshop on the occasion of uh, the World Environment Day 2021 allows us at least a virtual exchange. Ecosystem restoration is this year's theme, putting the UN decade on ecosystem restoration into the spotlight. We are all aware that this topic is of utmost importance. Our livelihood depends on healthy food, clean water, and unspoiled soils. If we want to protect our lives, we have to protect nature with its different ecosystems, habitats and species. Actual concepts such as the One Health approach should remind us that human health has always been in the center of environmental policy. There is no human health without a healthy environment. Still, if the international community announces a 
decade for ecosystem restoration. This means that ecosystems are suffering. We have to admit, we didn't care enough about sound ecosystems. Overexploitation, pollution, uncontrolled extension of settlements, traffic infrastructure, and intense agricultural uh, production affects many areas, also in my own country, Switzerland. Luckily, we don't suffer yet of drought and desertification. Luckily, we fully protected our forest already more than 100 years ago. But we have polluted water sites and corrected waterbeds, poor in biodiversity. No wonder that in the office I am heading, we develop projects to restore these degraded sites. Furthermore, we can't deny that international trade and imported products we people living in Switzerland consume leave a non-neglectable ecological footprint behind us. This negative impact on nature, on ecosystems, on habitats, on soil often occurs abroad, often in developing countries. Now we have to restore repair these degraded land and seascapes. Well, I am convinced that the knowledge is here, in particular inside International Geneva, where the world's competence centers for environment, health, trend, tr trade, development, labor are located. We have to make sure that this knowledge is shared that we all together amplify the message that sustainable development is possible. In this regard, Switzerland is glad to host so many centers of excellence here in Geneva. Alongside with Nairobi, Geneva is the global center of international environmental policy. In my work, I can feel the spirit of international environmental Geneva. I am deeply impressed by this place, this network that brings together so much expertise, commitment and engagement. Finally, let me express my gratitude to UNEP for its marvelous work all over the world and in particular here in Geneva. Nevertheless, the only reason why this place is so vibrant and stimulating is you. Each of you individually and all of you together make International Geneva the envi environment house and this place to what it is. So I thank you so much for your work. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for these words and for Underli underlining already uh, the sense of movement and the sense of network, which which is so much important in 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 what we do in the environment, but also in the spirit of the decade. And and to talk about the decade, I've got now the pleasure as well to call uh, my colleague Dominique Burgeon, who is the uh, Geneva director of FAO. FAO, together with UNEP, is uh, uh, co-leading. Uh, the UN decade on ecosystems restoration and it is really a pleasure to see this cooperation in the spirit of the one UN uh, that 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 embeds that is embedded in the uh, UN reform to see our two agencies uh, working together working hand in hand Dominique over to you thank you very much Bruno uh, excellencies colleagues uh, dear participants good afternoon we are of course very pleased to participate in this Geneva nature based solution dialogue uh, coming right after the launch of on Saturday of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, it is clear to us that this event and future ones can definitely contribute to amplify the call for protection and restoration of the planet's ecosystems. As you were saying, Bruno, you know, FAO and UNEP have a long history of partnership and will be joining forces to ensure that the vision of the UN Decade on Ecosystem re Restoration is fully realized. Ecosystems are, as was said, at the center of life. They provide us with priceless benefits from stable climate and breathable air 
to supply of water, food, while of course playing a role in protecting from disasters and diseases. Yet, as we all know, ecosystems face massive threats. Forests are being cleared. 10 million hectares of forest are lost every year. Rivers and lakes are polluted. Wetlands and peatlands are drained. Coasts and oceans are degraded and overfished. Just to mention a few examples. Conservation of healthy ecosystems is essential, but not sufficient. We need to go beyond and restore all ecosystems that can be restored. At the high-level virtual launch of the decade last Friday, FAO Director General Dr. Chu Dongyu highlighted that increasing pressure on the world's nature resource, natural resources is affecting the well-being of 40% of the global population. He called for a change of mindset as business as usual is not an option. The Director General also said that we need more efficient, inclusive, resilient and sustainable agri-food systems to help restore ecosystems and safeguard sustainable food production, leaving no one behind. The UN decade on ecosystem restoration is definitely an opportunity to reset our relationship with nature. Knowledge exists and promising initiatives are undertaken in many different contexts. The more is needed. Action is needed at scale, for example, to deliver on the existing commitment to restore 1 billion hectares of degraded land. We need to act on our commitment. Rebuilding ecosystems requires action from everyone, from individuals to communities, investors, politicians, and regional and international organizations. We are at the start of the decade. It means that together, FAO and UNEP, we will make sure we provide you with both the best of our expertise, as well as with a platform to exchange experiences and, as we would say, prosperity lives. Today's events brings an excellent contribution to that effort, and I would like to invite you also to join us for the, the next event, the FAO and UNEP uh, Geneva webinar event that will be hosting tomorrow to celebrate the launch of the decade, and where and which will take place also on the occasion of the World Ocean Day, which will therefore provide us an opportunity to have a special focus on these marine ecosystems, which are, as you know, under tremendous pressure. So with that, Bruno, I would like to thank you, and I would like to reaffirm FAO commitment to work really hand in hand with UNEP and where with the, the other willing partners to make this decade a success. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dominique, for, for these words. And, 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 and as you mentioned, it is a, a movement that is created uh, by, uh, uh, by citizens as well. And, and the United Nations will lead, we will call it, we will be also together with IUCN, which is so central in all nature-based solutions, and 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 work hand in hand all around the world but to do this we need also the support of all our partners and and member states are crucial and i've got now the pleasure to turn uh, to uh, ambassador uh, joaquin mazamartelli of el salvador uh, uh, el salvador has been from the very beginning one of the countries that supported the adoption of uh, the resolution of the UN General Assembly that, that set the decade into motion, that created the decade, and therefore, uh, from uh, very early on, uh, your mission ambassador has been in contact with the Geneva Environment Network and with UNEP in Geneva uh, to see how we could uh, work together. So, over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Excellency, dear friend of the Geneva Environment Network, distinguished panelists, and participants in the high-level dialogue on nature basic solution. At the outset, allow me to congratulate the organizer for such a timely occasion for the launch of the United Nations decade on ecosystem restoration, one of the most important initiatives led by El Salvador in the framework of the United Nations General Assembly. We believe that the Geneva National Basic Solution DALAIO are a key platform to facilitate further engagement and discussion among the stakeholders in international Geneva and beyond. In a year that should spark integral response for the challenges faced 
by nature and society. We commended the effort for the Geneva Environment Network and the International Union for Conservation of Nature, GNUCN, for including the topic of ecosystem restoration in their dialogue. Allow me also to show our appreciation for the very relevant interventions of our distinguished colleagues who have presented me, all of which will surely enrich our discussion. As we are all aware, the UN Decade of on ecos Ecosystem Restoration, which run from 2021 until 2030, in the opportunity to strengthen action for nature and people by employing nature and basic solutions on the largest scale yet to save our food, security, and clean water, and halt biodiversity loss and the impact of the climate change. El Salvador has a deep commitment to ecosystem restoration, which is aimed and supported the recovery of the great deep, demanded and destroying ecosystem in order to recover ecological functionality and the provision of goods and service the people value. Therefore, El Salvador presented the initiative to declare the International Decade of Ecosystem Restoration 2021-2030 during the high level meeting of the Bond Challenges held in Brazil in March 2018 to the group of Latin American and the Caribbean states, GRULA, which was also endorsed by the Central American Integration System, SICA. Later, during its 73rd session of the General Assembly, adopted the resolution 73 slides 2A4 on the matter. As the United Nations Decad was was on ecosystem restoration in launching in the occasion of the World Environment Day activity, we are saying that all the relevant stakeholders in Geneva and beyond will be able to amplify the call for the protection and revival of ecosystem all around the world, and will also provide important inputs as UN member states prepare their national strategy to implement their natural basic solution on restoring ecosystems. In closing, we expect that this session will be contributed to this momentum by highlighting on the importance of ecosystem restoration and its crucial impact on sustainable development. We will be sure participate a very productive discussion. Thank you very much and good. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And you made the link between sustainable development and ecosystem. And indeed, the two go hand in hand. You cannot have sustainable development if you don't have sustainable ecosystems. Now, World Environment Day this year was held uh, in Pakistan, and it was an incredible celebration of 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 unity uh, for nature and for the environment that uh, uh, you hosted ambassador in your country uh, so i've got the pleasure now to to turn to uh, his excellency ambassador uh, khalil uh, ashmi of pakistan uh, for the closing remarks of this official part of the agenda ambassador thank you so much um, for inviting me to this important uh, webinar dear colleagues and friends of the environment uh, let me also applaud uh, the Geneva Environment Network, uh, the IUCN, UNEP, the Swiss Federal Office, FAO, and everyone else uh, in putting together this important uh, event. Um, the World in Environment Day is significant for at least two primary reasons. One is to raise our ambition and redouble our efforts in preventing, halting, and reversing environmental and ecosystem degradation. Um, it's already been, already been mentioned that this day was also an occasion to launch 
to formally launch uh, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration from this year until 2030. Uh, I just want to make a few points. I am conscious of the time constraints. First is the drivers of ecosystem degradation, the devastating impacts arising from it and the myriad of uh, benefits from its res restoration are well known by now. The scientific evidence on the causes, effects, gains and solutions is also abundant. Uh, events like this, the webinar are uh, extremely useful in amplifying uh, awareness, not only about the urgency, but also the range of solutions that are available to conserve and restore ecosystems and thereby also contributing to the achievement of SDGs. Um, my second point is that even as progress is being made, there is much more, uh, and as this has been mentioned before, much more to be done across regions, governments, international organizations, businesses, civil society, media, local uh, community level to save our planet and to recreate ecosystems in which each one of us benefits from better air, better food, better water, and better biodiversity. Um, as uh, Mr. Bozzi, you mentioned Pakistan two days ago, Pakistan was the proud global host of this year's Environmental Day, and our Prime Minister was joined by a number of other global leaders to mark this important milestone. Um, <clears throat> my third point is that I'm very pleased to inform that Pakistan is leading by example um, in taking ambitious actions despite our limited economic resources. We have set uh, policies and initiatives in motion, uh, and uh, I can share a few of them with you. Three years ago, we launched the Ecosystem Restoration Initiative, under which an independent fund has been created, and we ourselves have contributed $50 million to this fund. We have so far planted 1 billion trees and set ourselves a target of planting an additional 9 billion uh, in the next three to four years. We have put in place a Recharge Pakistan project to restore 19 wetlands and regenerate aquifers by harvesting flood water. Uh, we've also set a target of converting 60% of our energy needs to renewables by 2030 and to replace 30% of road vehicles to electric vehicles by the end of this decade. And we have also introduced um, a ranking of cities under the Clean Green Pakistan Index based on green footprint and cleanliness. We are adding 15 new national parks to the existing 30. Uh, under the Protected Area Initiative, we have planned to develop 15 model protected areas throughout the country to conserve, or conserve over 7,300 square kilometers of land and mangroves areas. Dear colleagues, finally, even as we are proud of our own achievements and initiatives, we are mindful of the additional work that is needed. Uh, how I give the, uh, you know, it was mentioned the interconnected and interdependence uh, uh, of our world is such that we, uh, the, and the challenge, the nature of challenge is such that no single country can achieve the ambitious targets. Um, we, as I said earlier, we have done more in, in these areas relative to our economic resources. Therefore, enhanced international cooperation and partnerships would be essential to meet the climate and environmental goals. For this, in scaled up climate finance, technology sharing partnerships, capacity building uh, are crucial. I'm confident that the participants who follow our uh, this panel discussion would look into these areas in greater detail. And I wish them every uh, you know good wish. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and thanks uh, for uh, to Pakistan once again for hosting the World Environment Day 2021 and uh, helping launching this decade. You mentioned partnership. You mentioned solutions, and I think that's what we're going to discuss now: how we can also uh, use the partnership, the existing. Uh, dynamic that we've got in Geneva and elsewhere on nature-based solution for restoration and uh, how solution can help uh, the decade to move forward. So, Marcos, with this strong political commitment that has been expressed in this opening session, uh, I 
give the floor to you uh, to lead us on uh, the more technical, if I may say, discussion, but substantial discussion on uh, what it means to bring together ecosystems restoration and nature based solution. Over to you. Thank you very much, Bruno, and thank you very much to you all for these inspiring opening remarks. I'm glad to see that uh, there is this alignment in the way of thinking and in the way of imagining the future, especially in a context where many of the UN member states are also IUCN state members. So as, the, as our families get closer and we start imagining a sustainable future, it's important that we align our visions in order to converge to there. But the session now, it's, it's less going to be focused in the imagination, but more in the how do we make this possible. Let me just make a couple of uh, very quick remarks before giving the floor to our panelists. So IUCN as a co-host of this um, uh, UN, um, as, as this Geneva Nature-Based Solutions Dialogue, it's also very heavily involved from one side in the nature-based solutions with the creation of the standards, uh, bringing the community around to make this possible, giving the content and the scientific background for the nature-based solutions to be possible. And at the same time, it's a global partner for the um, um, UN Decade on Restoration, trying to bring also mobilizing the big community of scientists and members of IUCN around the UN Decade on Restoration. And as we start unfolding the, the questions that arise on how to make this possible, probably the first thing that arose is that um, restoration and ecosystem restoration has enormously evolved since it started in the 80s, when restoration was more about site rehabilitation and we went when we were talking about restoration at that time, it was more about restoring a specific degraded site. While today, the level of ambition we are all trying to achieve with this UN decade and the alignment with the Sustainable Development Goals, it's radically different, qualitatively different, and we are aiming for a global change that goes across sectors and addressing entire ecosystems. So it's not just about degraded sites, but about the scale of degradation we are um, impacting at ecosystem level and how we can make a similar scale response at a planetary level and at an ecosystem level. And some of the tools that the IUCN has been developed in the last years, like the IUCN Red List of Ecosystems that assess what is the risk of ecosystem collapse can inform some of those decisions and how do we go to scale? How do we make this happen at a, at a bigger level? And that's some of the questions that we are going to be asking today. What are the questions that we need to remember when we are aiming for such a big scale process? And that's what some of the panelists are going to be uh, answering. How do we connect the dots between what we already know and what we aim to do, what we are dreaming to do right now? So um, if we are to be courageous to imagine, we need to be also courageous now to implement and to think, how do we make this possible? And the first step is, of course, imagining a sustainable future. Now we need to move into how do we make that possible? So with further to say, I'm going to give the floor now to Radhika Murthy, who is the Global Director for the uh, Global Ecosystem Management Program in, in IUCN, who's going to uh, talk us about the alignment between the nature-based solution and the restoration uh, process. With further to say, I give the floor over to you, Radhika. Um, thank you, Marcos. Um, and thanks a lot for that really useful introduction. And thank you very much to the, the, the former panel, especially the ambassadors from El Salvador and Pakistan. IUCN has had the pleasure of working very closely with both the Restoration Initiative of Pakistan, as well as working with El Salvador in helping table that resolution on the decade at the, at the General Assembly. And it really is a pleasure for us to be part of this and be able to share further. So as Marcos was saying, you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, going to scale, uh, making sure that the whole world is buzzing about uh, uh, restoration. 
But if we keep restoration within the conservation community, we really, really stand the risk of missing out on purposefully designed restoration that can benefit both people and nature. And I don't think we can afford to choose between one or the other. You know, population growth, uh, finite and limited space on this planet, finite and limited resources on this planet. So how do we solve one problem and not create another problem out of that? How do we use restoration as a pathway? Well, a lot of things have actually aligned in the past and, and we're not far from it. First and foremost, this definition on uh, nature-based solutions itself that was adopted in 2016. If you look at it carefully, it very clearly states three ways you can do NBS, protect, sustainably, sustainably manage and restore both natural and modified ecosystems, whereby you're doing it in ways in get, in, in able to get societal uh, benefits as well as biodiversity benefits. So it's this, it's striving for this two-way solution and it won't always be binary, uh, but you look at trade-offs, et cetera, which I'll come to. So the, the map is already there. The blueprint is already there. Restoration um, is one of the key pillars of the success of nature-based solutions. And this, the, the array of societal challenges we're talking about, all of these have the potential to benefit from restoration. And just to recap, in the last year, you know, again, uh, stars are aligning. We were able to, after two years of a lot of work, we were able to launch the standard, the blueprint that can help all of us stay accountable to one framework when we do nature-based solutions. And this is really important from the NBS side because we can go around uh, sticking seedlings in the ground without thinking about the consequences of monocultures, of, uh, you know, dieback, of uh, restoration not done properly uh, but how you and you and you can't necessarily claim that somewhere somehow it's benefiting people how are we purposeful in designing restoration so it's not just about bringing back vegetation cover or reducing soil degradation but it's also providing tangible direct indirect immediate and future benefits to people so how do we do this well one of the things is to drive this through uh, through leadership I mean, this decade of science task force, you know, we've got an uh, impressive group of people volunteering their time to help drive this. And it's called the science task force, but you'll see GAM is part of it. And it's really, really important to collate different sources of knowledge as we move this forward. How do we join the dots through this leadership and including through uh, the leadership of FAO, UNEP, uh, IUCN and others who are driving it? making sure that there's consistency. And, and Marcos, who's part of my team, can talk a lot better about this. But um, the opportunity with this new classification system, for years we don't, we haven't had a definition of ecosystems itself. So how do you create consistency and connections and join the dots? Now we have a classification system that was just uh, launched in March this year, which can become that blueprint again, or that, that base map for all ecosystems to show around the world, how are mangroves doing, how are, um, seagrass is doing as we try to help them recover and working with very quantitative measures. Are we going more into the green with our actions because there's something wrong there or are we reducing the risk of collapse of ecosystems? Ecosystems collapse just like species uh, become extinct. So which way are we going and how do we actually systematically measure that? And also what can we build on? Things like the Bond Challenge Barometer it's worked for forest. How do we replicate that for other ecosystems? What are the things we can tap into and actually work with already? How do we bring people together? You know, different experts, different groups, different networks that are actually already working on things. We don't have to create everything from scratch. How do we tap into people? We have 17,000 volunteer experts from different ecosystem types. Also outside of IUCN, things like Global Mangrove Alliance already exists. Similarly, how do we leverage existing initiatives and new initiatives? How do we connect with each other? These are things all ongoing, part of the process, working with the bond challenge, building on that, you know, looking at rangelands, looking at uh, the community of practice around mangroves. And then any new tool we create, I'm sure you'll agree with me that it needs to be aligned with existing and past tools. More and more tools and guidelines, yes, but how do we align principles of eco-system restoration in this case to really leverage the benefits 
of restoration to nature-based solutions and the value of nature-based solutions in informing restoration. So this is some ongoing work and you can see how we've mapped out the nine principles which are in the making and will be launched in September at our Congress and how they can they have the potential to align to nature-based solutions. So again, the scene is set. The decade of, uh, UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration can be one of the most influential tools in realizing our NBS um, uh, ambitions. And it's not just one way. NBS has so much to benefit from re uh, restoration and, and restoration get, can get so much direction from nature-based solutions in making sure there's a win-win for people and nature. So just to set the scene with that and inspire us a little bit. Thank you very much. And Marcos, back to you. Thank you very much, Radhika. Thanks for such an inspiring um, sort of options that we need to explore. And, and thank you very much also to set uh, one of the main challenges, uh, which are the trade-offs that often happen between restoration and development, because that provides a very nice framework for our next speaker, um, who is Musonda Mumba, the director of the Rome Center for Sustainable Development at UNDP who can maybe explore further on what are, how do we make the restoration, bring nature into the development and conservation at a scale. Uh, Musonda, uh, Mumba, over to you. Thank you very much, Marcos. Um, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, thank you so much for having me. Um, I just could not imagine because when I used to work at UN Environment and when the UN Decade was launched on the 1st of March 2019, in no way any of us imagined that we would be launching this particular decade in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but I suppose it's also the poignancy of life in the sense that it has really, um, this particular pandemic, COVID-19, has also demonstrated and shown us our fractured relationship with nature. In 2019, I was fortunate, um, in, in 2011 actually, I was fortunate enough to have led a program together with UNDP, UNEP and IUCN focused on mountains, on ecosystem-based adaptation. What I learned from that experience in the mountains of Peru, in the Andes, in Uganda, in Mount Elgon, and also in Nepal, in, in, in the Himalayas, was the intersectionality of a lot of the issues, but also how we need to look at nature-based solutions from a very systems thinking kind of lens. And what was very interesting in all these three countries was very much the role of women, youth, and also indigenous peoples in terms of managing these ecosystems. And I think this is what we need to also remember as we chat the way forward in going ahead, because now we've come full circle, UN Food Systems Summit now is already talking about agroecology, something that indigenous peoples and traditional peoples have done and to make sure that their ecosystems are intact. So how are we coming back again to those issues that we did not listen to in the past? I also want to mention that um, I think what, what's exciting right now is to also see um, at the Rome Center, uh, my team and I are supporting the G20 presidency of Italy together with COP26, this COP presidency uh, to, to, to the climate COP. We've begun to see how nature-based solutions are now front and center and at the table of G20 discussions. And really this is a, a shift, a massive shift. Um, and we saw from the previous presidency, the Saudi presidency and now the Italian presidency, really discussions on why nature-based solutions is important but also it's the one thing that really connects all the three real conventions, biodiversity, land and climate. And so in going forward, I think it's important as, as, as um, the Radica mentioned, really the centrality of people and planet. And this is something that is also as the theme um, of the G20 uh, going forward, the Italians are calling people, planet and prosperity. How do we prosper in a sustainable manner? And I liked your slide, uh, Radhika, on really the protect, sustainable, manage and restore. Because when I remember when the, the resolution came out, and I'm hoping colleagues have, have seen it, when the resolution for the decade came out, the word before restore is conserve. How do we conserve what we have? Because even in restoring some of these degraded spaces, there is no guarantee in a 1.5 degree world that some of these species will come up. I was fortunate enough to have lived in Switzerland many years ago in some parts of the Alps. Vegetation has stopped growing in the, with the increase of temperature. 
And we've already begun to see the shifts and the changes. So how do we really rethink how we do that restoration in a more holistic and systemic way? So I'd be happy to, to discuss and also explore um, other opportunities as we go forward. Thank you very much, Marcus. Over to you. Thank you very much, Tunta. Thank you very much for setting up the scene and for making my life easier also by introducing the the challenge and the importance of the indigenous peoples and women, because that leads very nicely to our next speaker, uh, Pasan Dolma Sherpa, who is the executive director for the Center of Indigenous People Research and Development, the CPRED, and also the former co-chair of the Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform, the CIPP. Um, before uh, leaving the floor to Pasan Sherpa, I just want to remind everyone that you can post uh, your mm -hmm. questions in the questions and uh, uh, an answer uh, button. Mm -hmm. uh, we will not answer them directly. We'll answer all the questions at the end, but feel free to pose them as, as they arise. Um, and without further to say, um, I will give the floor now to Pasan Sherpa. Over to you, Pasan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcos. Um... Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure uh, to be in the panel, uh, uh, distinguished uh, delegates and uh, uh, all the uh, participants here. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to join this important event. Uh, very great pleasure to meet all uh, my panelists uh, and uh, also uh, very thankful for the remarks from uh, for the opening remarks as well as the response from my earlier speakers. Um, on the importance of uh, connecting the people and the planet together. So uh, allow me to uh, give uh, from uh, the indigenous people perspectives on the nature based solution that uh, as we all are aware that the different study at the global uh, at, uh, as well as at the national level already come up with the fact that how the interconnectedness of the indigenous people with the nature and that contributed for the climate change resilience biodiversity and ecosystem so uh, bearing in the mind that the fact that even the ipcc of the 2019 talks about indigenous people's uh, traditional livelihoods especially our agricultural practices dealing with the fighting with the climate change resilience uh, uh, for this uh, impacts of the climate change and uh, as well as, as we all are aware that uh, six percent of the indigenous people around the world with the 10 percent of the land tenure security contributed enhancement of the 80 percent of the biodiversity so this already different study even the ICBES and IUCN in ILO and IPMG World Bank IPCC the different resource already comes up with the fact that how important role that indigenous people could play um, now to deal with the uh, you know nature-based solution or impacts of climate change or resilience of the whole uh, degraded uh, biodiversity or uh, the uh, the crisis we have been facing at the moment uh, in our study uh, and also in our uh, local experience on the ground that uh, already comes to the fact that uh, indigenous peoples is a part of nature. So nature is an indigenous people and indigenous people is a nature, is a life. So the interconnectedness of the value system, the cultural, the traditional, the interdependency, the symbiotic relation that cannot be separated indigenous people from the nature. But the, but the, but the most challenging part we have been facing in the, in the name of the conservation or name of the national park or name of the different, uh, con, you know, the conservations, uh, arena that uh, that interconnectedness of the indigenous people and the nature could not be understood consequently in the name of the conservation national power consequently continuously indigenous people have been separated consequently now the indigenous people are like a fish without water the different uh, uh, stories from the ground that yesterday I was in one of the panel with the Indigenous People Federation in in uh, in the Nepal uh, on the uh, on the occasion of the Environmental Day, that cries of the Bote community Indigenous people in uh, in Chita National Park that uh, could not be uh, even uh, tolerated. How she's been or her community is struggling just for continuation of the traditional livelihoods, the governance system, and then uh, how she uh, she desperate that her cries will not be a further disappear in the air so so uh, so that also shows that the continuation of becoming indigenous people homeless and presented as illegal settlers in their own uh, own ancestral domain despite the fact that contributed for uh, you know nature based solution or the restoration of the climate change 
So, uh, you know, the good part is that uh, uh, indigenous people customary governance system institution that uh, really contributed for nature based solution and deal with the impacts of climate change restoration of whole uh, this uh, present crisis. But and then, uh, you know, hearing bearing in mind and with the study of the different study already come up with the fact that uh, at least the UN, UN FCC and uh, uh, even the CBD, even IUCN, they come up with the importance of discourse on the NBS and also dealing with the issues of indigenous people. For the first time in the UN FCC in the history of 25 years of the struggle of indigenous people in one in 2015 in the COP21 talks about like establishment of the local community indigenous people platform that talks about like how indigenous people knowledge can be balanced with the science knowledge or how indigenous people contribution of the our practices contribute for climate change resilience. So this initiative is praiseworthy, no doubt. Ayushians coming up with a, a radical presentation also really that how indigenous uh, the Ayushians uh, different criteria in the global standard of NBS, especially the criteria one, five, eight to directly deal with the indigenous people. And then th that that is a positive aspect of nature based solution dealing with the also indigenous people issues and concerns and then also the and the like uh, you know in many countries like in nepal also the uh, the different policies uh, especially climate change or forestry or biodiversity they are integrating and mainstreaming nature based solution in different policy and program which is also a good part and then the and the cbd also talks about like expansion of 30 persons and uh, also uh, uh, you know the, and there is a big threat how how it will be dealt with, like uh, uh, the ambassador from the Pakistan also talks about, like uh, you know, expanse of the national park, which is good. But how we deal with uh, whether we will continue the business as usual model of uh, you know separating indigenous people in the name of the conservation, or we come up with the fact of the guaranteed for the ensuring the rights of indigenous peoples uh, and based on the right based uh, uh, approach of conservation uh, that also reflected by RRA in the study. So this is this is a very major issue that interconnectedness of indigenous people from the nature to be dealt with and be understood very well so that indigenous people could uh, could contribute for further continued and uh, and that has been already contributed for generation and will be continue further from a future generation and then, as I already said, that uh, you know the different study uh, in the national policy framework and biodiversity action plans, including NAPS and NDCs, and then you know they are working on uh, more on streaming on nature based solution. But the problem here is most of the study, including IPCC and including uh, UN uh, FCC and uh, you know UNESCO or IPCC or uh, you know um, MCA, where I'm also partly affiliated, that more are, are trying to Reading the indigenous knowledge and science, but the problem is there. Most of the research is more depending on the secondary data. So the, when the when this kind of very important uh, uh, study are depending on the secondary data, the big challenges faced by indigenous peoples is like how they are dealing on the with the uh, struggling on the ground will hardly be reflected. So so uh, the breeding of indigenous knowledge and uh, science is very important to uh, show the world that how indigenous peoples knowledge our value system is interconnectedness, but the challenge is remaining there because of the absence of the disaggregated data to show how indigenous people customary governance system knowledge values have contributed for the sustaining the natural resources ecosystem and climate change resilience. And another challenge is that the implementation, how it's been implemented, how sensitive we are, how sensitized our government policy, our, our government bodies or, 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 or different uh, bodies inside and outside the UN C and the decision makers regarding the role and contribution of indigenous people, the women and the local communities and the forest dependent uh, different uh, deprived communities. So this sensitization and uh, coming up with the fact of the dealing with the disaggregated data is very, very uh, important uh, to deal with the nature based solution. And uh, if we really want to uh, change the uh, paradigm shift that uh, the business as usual model would be changed with the respect of the human rights of indigenous people and creating the right best conservation model. With this one, thank you. Uh, thank you. I will come up with any, if there is any response for the uh, question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Koshan. Um, very inspiring um, speech, changing our paradigm of uh, ensuring that the indigenous people are part of the equations to ensuring that indigenous peoples are part of the solution. And how can we use that uh, indigenous knowledge and perception 
to be part of the solution, not only of the equation. That's very inspiring. Um, now, one of the now we're going to move to the next speaker um, to be sure that we bring into the table also some uh, examples and actions on the ground, and we wanted to be sure also that. Uh, the UN decade of restoration is not only about restoring forest or restoring land, but it's also about restoring fresh water, restoring marine ecosystems. So it's uh, my great pleasure now to pass it over to Nirmal Shah, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Nature Seychelles. to illustrate Thank you, some of the concrete examples. Thank, you, you, Marcos. Thank you, Marcos. Excellencies, colleagues, friends. Thank you for this great opportunity and thank you for attending this important um, meeting. My name is Nirma Shah, I'm a Seshawa biologist and sustainable development practitioner. I've been implementing nature-based solutions and ecosystem restoration projects in various disciplines for 40 years. This includes fisheries, agriculture, ecotourism, coastal zone management, and protected areas. Um, I run Nature Seychelles and today I've chosen two real world or real life case studies to present to you. And we'll start with the first one, which is coral reef restoration. Um, uh, this is one of our flagship species. We've been running it for 11 years now. And the idea was to move from our very successful restoration work um, on islands. We restored entire islands of forests and wetlands for the purpose of saving critically endangered birds on the IUCN red list. After 15 years of successfully down, down listing these birds because we had implemented um, uh, these ecosystem restoration as well as nature-based solutions for the island owners, such as hotels and, and tourism surface, um, services, we've moved to the marine area. So as you know, um, coral reefs have been suffering from bleaching bleaching caused by massive climate change. And Seychelles was, um, uh, 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 we had uh, big problems in the Seychelles starting from 1998. A large plume of hot water came into the Western Indian Ocean and we had up to 95% coral mortality in the Seychelles. Today, because of lack of time, I won't talk about the importance of coral reefs. I think most of you know the importance of coral reefs especially to tropical islands and tropical coasts. But our project aim was to use, for the first time actually, um, large scale coral reef restoration to enhance natural recovery and ecosystem services. We were not trying to turn back the clock and bring back um, ecosystems and habitats that had disappeared, but we were trying to set up novel ecosystems to actually provide the same ecosystem services. So um, uh, we chose the Kusa Island Special Reserve, which we manage. It's a 50-year-old um, terrestrial and marine protected area. And here you can see on this small map um, uh, our novel reef, our transplanted reef, our designer reef. We had two control areas as well, um, a degraded control area and a healthy control area. So what happened in a, you know, over the last 10 years, we leveraged 1.3 million US dollars from USAID, the GEF and others. We farmed 34 species of corals underwater in underwater nurseries. Almost 44,000 corals were farmed. We restored this incredible area of 5,400 square meters of degraded reef. That's the size of a football field. We discovered super corals, which um, were resilient to bleaching. We grew them and we um, uh, and we planted them. The fish populations increased by 300%. One of the interesting things and useful things that we did, we published a coral reef restoration toolkit some years ago, and it's online free. We trained 62 practitioners from 22 countries um, uh, and uh, through actually three international training programs. We established a center for ocean restoration awareness and learning as an international center for marine restoration and conservation. Published five papers on this coral reef restoration. Three are currently in prep. And we've been featured on many, many news channels and in newspapers and in blogs. This includes CNN, BBC, Sky News, Reuters, etc. So what are the next steps? We are now part of a very large regional project of about 10 million US dollars um, uh, in in, in our component, we want to improve reef restoration with new science. There's a lot since we started 10 years ago, we were the first to 
to actually implement this large scale project. Now there's a lot more people, a lot more scientists, a lot more knowledge. So we want to um, gather that, bring people on board. We want to set up actually land-based coral mariculture to, in, to increase the number of corals that we are producing. We want to increase ocean nurseries. We'll produce thousands and thousands of heat resilient corals, research and augment knowledge. We want to train a lot of local people, including local communities. And uh, you may know that there are quite a lot of coastal protection projects going on around the world in Seychelles. We have a few where we want to create hybrid structures, which include man-made structures um, planted with corals. So um, the next project builds on all our work on, on land and on sea, where we are going to set up the first locally managed marine area in the Seychelles. It's called LEAP, Locally Empowered Area Protection. This is a project we're implementing with IUCN, and this will take all the work that we've done in conservation, in ecotourism, um, marine restoration, and so forth into the community. We've chosen two marine protected areas on Mahi Island in the Seychelles, where we want to uh, um, help the community conserve, restore. We want to make them more aware. We want to create livelihood actions and actually influence policy change within government so that it allows local people to um, manage the areas that are important for them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nirmal. Thank you very much for showing us how local success stories can grow and get to scale and how making the connections with others is so promising. Um, I'm going to now give the floor to our last speaker, which is also our host, and that's why it's the last one. And so because we are based in Geneva, I'm going to give now the floor to Jill Mulhausen, the Director General of the Water Office of the Geneva Canton. Thank you very much for hosting us. And over to you, Jill. Thank you very much, Marcos. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome uh, virtually in Geneva, a so beautiful water country. So um, in the few minutes that are given today to speak about uh, almost 25 years of experience on rivers restoration in the region of Geneva, I will concentrate my talk on only four levels of learned lessons. The first one is that uh, the inscription of ecosystem restoration on the highest legal reference and the strong political will to bring resources. It's not possible if you don't have those uh, two uh, key factors not only to bring money, but also uh, to have human skills uh, disponible. In Geneva, the opportunity is, has been created in 1997, at least 10 years before it was done at the federal or national level. So you can see that sometimes the action on the local level can go faster than uh, at, at, the, at the highest one. Uh, two members of the state government, particularly touched by some environmental voices who claimed about the real bad states of the rivers at this period, succeed in writing the restorations in the cantonal water law. It's, uh, if you want to go there, it's article um, 43, which permitted to use hydroelectrical and pumping fees or taxes for river restoration in the perspective of sustainable development. A special fund has been created at that time and is supplied with about 10 million of Swiss francs each year. So in 25 years, I make you, uh, I leave you to make the addition. The second level is the whites for the width of goals pursued not only on ecological and economical scales, but also on the social one. The legal text says that the functions of the river have to be restored. It's quite simple. But the team in charge of this program had the intelligence to understand it in its wider signification. So that in addition with water risk management against flooding or low water draft and so on, and with biodiversity and ecosystems recovering, 
social benefits for the population were developed since the beginning of the first project. Trades, information panels, fishing or bathing points, for example, were created and helped the projects to be adopted by the people. This is particularly the case concerning the lake. In fact, for the lake, we systematically take advantage of infrastructure building to implement the bank restoration. The third level is the important role of civil society and the mode of partnership to develop with associations, citizens group, or other kind of actors. Listening to and involving them to bring ideas into the reality of the project are the two key factors to obtain the possibility to build something in the territory. Nature-based solutions are not so evident to, ad to understand, especially for urban populations, as for farmers, for example. We have had some special tools to share those discussions. We call them charte in French or charter perhaps in English. The fourth level is the obligation to find solutions considering the integrated management of the water resources in a transboundary dimension. Geneva is quite systematically the lowest point for all the rivers of the basin and have to involve French collectivities so that quality and quantity of water can be improved and guaranteed downstream. I hope we can bring to publication an illustration of, of all the tools we had to create with French collectivities during this summer. All those tools have been created and experimented between the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 21st century brought together, they have permitted to restore 40 kilometers. It's about 10% of the 380 kilometers of the Geneva's rivers. The results are not only on the material and measurable length of restored banks, uh, sorry, of restored banks, but also on the population consciousness. It has actually produced a strong debate on the place of water in our human lives between agriculture and nature, and also the place of aquatic ecosystems in a urban context. I thank you for your engage engagement uh, at the international level, for your attention st and stay for questions. I would be also glad to show you the results on the ground as the photos or, or the pictures is showing you uh, now. So, Marcus, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Jill, and I hope they will have the opportunity to go together to visit those restoration initiatives. It will be a great pleasure to see that on the ground. Um, now, uh, we are going to um, take a short break with a video. Uh, while you can use that time to pose your questions in the questions and answer bottom, while we see this uh, inspiring video, and then we come back for the questions and answers. I'm going to give it over to you, Diana, for the, for the video. Thank you very much for all the panelists. It's been extremely inspiring. Thank you very much. You asked me why it's important that we restore. And the reason is simple. The world is now full. There is no excess space. We have to have every bit of ecological capacity that exists on the planet to get into a future stable state. The more we lose, the more difficult that is, and so we actually have to claw back some of that that we have lost. We have to restore to get back to a ability to exist on the planet. You can't manage this world species by species. It can't be done. People have tried, but you end up with these, you know, irreconcilable trade-offs. You know, who says that an elephant's more important than the grass that it eats, for instance? Whereas if you stand back and say, no, they both actually interact within an ecosystem, and it's the ecosystem that we have to protect, that you make progress. But over the years of my life, I've seen that the global ecosystem contains people and people are the big drivers in it. And so you have to treat this as a 
coupled social ecological system and that's really where the big sort of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary breakthroughs are taking place. Systems ecology can contribute to the restoration process in a variety of ways. You can't restore if all that's going to happen is to slide back to the previous state. And so systems ecology often focuses us on what the drivers of the problem are rather than the symptoms of the problem. And we have to solve those underlying drivers if we want our intervention to be persistent over time. If I were to critique my own field of biodiversity conservation, I would say we've been talking to ourselves for far too long. And therefore, we've ghettoized the problem. It's a, it's a problem which occurs in you know, national parks or, or somewhere far away, and it's dealt by those people. But in fact, if we are to win the battle to make the world a sustainable place, the main place we have to work is in the lived landscape where ordinary people exist. And that means that it's everyone's responsibility and everyone has a role in ensuring that we have a sustainable future. This video was a tribute. You might have recognized uh, Bob Scholz, who is uh, unfortunately no more with us. And now uh, my colleague uh, is going to, um, Alice is going to share with you a second video from a UNEP champion that we received uh, a couple of seconds ago and that we are going to discover with you. Good afternoon. My name is Roberta Annan and I'm dialing in from Accra, Ghana. I'm the United Nations Environment Program Creative Economy Supporter. I'm very excited to be allowed to share my perspective on this topic. You know, um, a statistic that came to me when I was doing my research on land degradation is that by 2050, 95% of land will be degraded. We all know that land degradation is the leading cause of the plant cycle, nutrient cycle of plants. And so this is a challenging thing that needs to be addressed immediately. There are four things that I'd like to highlight today. Number one is that healthy soils sustain lives. So it's important for us to revive soil to be able to revive the plant's life cycle. Number two is that our relationship with nature is also failing. I'm sure you're all aware of this syndrome that is called the Shifton Baseline Syndrome. That means that human beings are becoming less concerned about the environment. And this is a challenge that we also need to address. And number three is a topic that is quite dear to me. It's about culture and heritage. Our indigenous cultures are, and knowledge are closely linked to our environment. So as that is degrading and being eroded, our culture and is also being eroded. And we all want to protect our culture and our, our heritage and pass it on from generation to generation. So it's important to understand the link between culture and the environment. And lastly, human health is linked to the environment. And as we are all living through these challenging times with COVID-19 pandemic, we should understand that our environment is closely linked to health. And if we want to be able to revert to, the, to, to um, some form of normalcy during this pandemic, then we also need to address how we view the environment, how we protect it, so that we can spread, stop spreading diseases and viruses like COVID-19, and also protect and minimize and mitigate the risk that are associated with these diseases. So thank you so much for allowing me to share my, my views and I wish you a successful summit. Thank you. And as you heard, this was uh, Roberta Annan, a UN Environment Supporter uh, on Creative Economy. And with that, over to you, Marcos. Thank you very much. And we are starting to receive some very interesting questions now that I'm gonna pass on to our dear panelists. Mm. The first one, mm, one of the topics that it's clearly been 
raised today in the conversation is the role of indigenous communities and what roles um, we should uh, provide to them. And one of the questions from the audience is, how can we ensure that indigenous and local communities are front and center in restoration strategies, but also in plans global to local level? That's maybe a, um, a question that I may ask Pasang to try to answer and eventually um, it can be complemented if you want by Musunda. Uh, Pasang, do you have any suggestions in how to answer that specific question? Sure, sure. Yeah, sure, Marcos. Uh, shall we wait uh, uh, more uh, if there is more question or should I uh, just respond? There is also a second question that it's very related to this one if, if you want to answer both. Uh, the second one yeah. is how could we promote the recognition and the contribution of indigenous communities um, to the conservation of ecosystems and climate change at a political level. But the first question is more, how can we ensure that we bring indigenous and local communities more at the center on the strategies and the planning? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, that's a very, very important question. And that is also uh, one of the main uh, concerns of indigenous peoples. How could we uh, ensure uh, indigenous peoples uh, uh, to be the part of the main discourse of the uh, climate change or discourse of the natural resources governance system? So, uh, so uh, as I as I also presented in uh, in my uh, uh, in my earlier uh, presentation, that uh, one of the most important part is uh, uh, awareness and capacity uh, building. The capacity building of indigenous people is very very important, especially understanding their role and contribution, and as well as the different international human rights and treaties, how that it has been protecting their uh, their governance system, their knowledge system, cultural practices. So that, that that knowledge system enhancement of the knowledge system and the awareness of their role and contribution for continuation for indigenous people is is very important for their meaningful and effective participation in the climate change or natural resources discourse. Because the problem here, what happened, like, uh, you know, oh, we have uh, indigenous people in the uh, climate change discourse, or we have indigenous people in our meeting, but the effective participation is hardly been there because, because of the level of the awareness and the capacity. So for that one, the attention of the global uh, bodies to, uh, you know, empower indigenous people. And, and, and on top of that, the most and the important is that our uh, gover uh, government or our decision makers or our stakeholders or parties or different different decision makers need to understand that how important it is to bring up the voice of indigenous people whose voice has not been heard for centuries, but the realizing the fact, the role and contribution of indigenous people very important. So bringing them, giving that uh, you know uh, space for the uh, discourse. So this is this is the two way of like uh, you know first encouraging indigenous people, but at the same time realizing the importance of uh, uh, indigenous people's engagements. So this will help for uh, effective strategy. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Pasang. Um, very inspiring. I don't know if you want to complement uh, Musonda. Um, Sure, I could compliment very briefly. I just want to add, and thank you so much, Pasang, for that. Um, I also want to add just very quickly that I think it's important to also recognize that there's been um, a, a lot of challenges with a lot of um, environmental defenders. And as such, I think it's important to recognize the, the, the necessity of really policy um, on the ground and in countries to protect this 5% uh, uh, population that takes care of 80% of our biodiversity. We're also realizing more and more that, you know, the diseases that are emerging are also as a result of monocultures, the absence of diversity. And so we have to recognize really the importance of this community. So in engaging them is making sure that there is a safe space, even at the political space and, and, and making sure that we understand the importance of this going forward. Thank you. Yeah, Marcos, can I can I just jump in one thing just to uh, add uh, uh, on the uh, Musunda? Please. Yeah. So, uh, so um, uh, I, I um, very nice to meet you, Musunda. After uh, many, after a long gap, yeah. I think another part is also uh, very important. Is uh, you know, uh, uh, important is investing uh, for a lot of uh, you know, like uh, you know, 
it's in my own reflection now working with indigenous people almost for two decades at the moment that how much money or how much resources or how much time or how much strength or how much our you know, advocacy lobby or how much priority has given for you know supporting indigenous people this is the uh, big question that uh, goes to uh, each of our mind each of our um, you know uh, on our uh, on our responsibility you know, and then the, now we talk about uh, indigenous peoples, uh, you know, uh, the coming up with the fact that, but, uh, but the very important is, it is very important, the prime focus to, uh, um, you know, uh, support indigenous people, invest on indigenous peoples, knowledge system to promote, uh, recognize, and also, uh, you know, bring them uh, their voice on the discourse of climate change, discourse of natural resource governance, discourse of the biodiversity mechanism strategy, you know, and in, in the absence of that, that, uh, I mean, the business as usual will be uh, continued because, you know, in the voice of indigenous people, even uh, the, for the full and effective participation, the business as usual model is sure to be continued uh, in the name of the biodiversity or conservation. So, uh, that's, I would yeah. like to highlight that part. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Prasang. Um, I wonder if he, uh, this relates very much to the next question, uh, which is how could we promote the this contribution from indigenous people communities um, and the role they have in conservation of ecosystems or restoration how can we promote this role at a more political level i don't know if you have any suggestions yeah. in this line yeah. uh, radica sure I'm, I'm happy to answer that i um, i think um i think the simple answer to that is let's move beyond representation as as Pasang was saying because if you look at the construct of nature-based solutions, it is basically going back to many of the sustainable ways of living that Indigenous people were the first ones to do. They were the first NBS managers. So essentially, if you if you're to work off, you know, the standard as well as uh, the, the guidance so far, it would be impossible to do a get a nature-based solution right on the ground within a scape or landscape or seascape where indigenous people are involved without tapping into their knowledge, without tapping into their systems, without tapping into what they've been doing for generations to survive. So I think um, how do we improve their representation in terms of being the drivers of the solution is not an issue. Uh, certainly listening to Pasang, it it is more about how do we um, increase their representation or get the voices he heard more strongly in their global policy arena. And I think that's what all of us agencies, uh, the UN colleagues, as well as IUCN and others need to work very closely with uh, with Indigenous peoples groups to do. And um, in 2016, this was recognized within IUCN's governance framework. We have uh, state members, we have NGO members, but 2016 was the first time, unfortunately it took us that long, to launch the Indigenous Peoples Groups, groups that can become members of this conservation union. Th that's the start, but we have a long way to go. Um, I can't recall how many groups we have now uh, in our membership to really bring that at the forefront of decision making and not just represent them um, in terms of you know a tick box exercise so i would say in on the ground this is our opportunity to really co-develop um, uh, robust solutions impossible to do it without looking at what's been done on that landscape or seascape and how things were done in a more sustainable way but certainly many of us need to you know, pull our efforts and political uh, clout together to open up those global spaces. But the more we can collaborate uh, on the ground, the easier the rest will come and follow. Excellent. Thank you very much, Radhika. I'm going to ask one last question, and then we are going to just close the event with a, a round of very quick take home messages. But there is one more question I wanted to share. And it's and how it's, can we ensure that socioeconomic development and restoration for the marine area while preserving ecosystem services? I think this is very relevant both for marine and freshwater um, ecosystems. So I, I wonder if Jill and Nir, Nirmal can um, both have a, a quick um, uh, go to this question and then we'll make a round of take home messages and stop there. Can you just repeat the question, please? Because I don't read it. Uh, it's about the challenge between how do we ensure the conservation of coastal and marine areas and 
at the same time ensuring socioeconomic development. So the trade off between socioeconomic yeah. development and preservation of the ecosystem services. How can we manage this dilemma? Is development uh, against uh, socioeconomic development or? So perhaps my answer will be short. Uh, in Switzerland, I think it's quite a, a challenge to uh, address uh, um, the good, um, uh, how do you say, uh, taxes. Uh, so you, you have to take taxes on uh, hydroelectric or on, uh, on uh, drinkable water and to address them for the biodiversity and social goals. And uh, with this, you can uh, you can manage with all the three uh, goals of uh, sustainable development. So I in in, in Switzerland, it's uh, I think the main um, the main challenge to do now it's to uh, equilibrate the financial uh, provenance of, um, of uh, the contributions. Okay, so um, for us in the Seychelles and in the Western Indian Ocean, the first thing to understand is the value of the ecosystem. Once we understand the values of the ecosystem, because there are various values, including direct and indirect values. Um, uh, so here, for example, in the Seychelles, people do understand what it means to conserve the environment because conservation of the environment leads directly to economic development, mostly tourism. So for us to have our um, upper end tourism, the odd gam tourism, as we call it, we have to conserve the environment. So I think that's a sine qua non. People understand that. Um, uh, people also understand that to have uh, the kind of lifestyles we have, the kind of uh, peace and quiet we have um, in these islands, we need to preserve, not only conserve the environment, but actually restore parts of the environment which were destroyed during colonial times. Um, which include uh, forests, mangroves, and coral reefs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to Thank all, you. Your, all of you for these fantastic messages. We are two minutes to um, sure. the time, so I ask for a round of very short take-home messages that you would like to stress to the audience. Um, maybe we can just follow the same order as during the presentations. Mm, Radhika, would you like to go first? Very short, quick take home messages for our audience. Sure. I just want to remind us of the purpose of these Geneva dialogues. I think restoration will be, you know, this uh, this dream, uh, this this right thing to do by nature amongst the conservation community. Um, and that is a great thing. We're still committed, but it's not going to realize its full potential unless we engage the development sectors. And one of the reasons for us to start this series of events was to really tap into the community of Geneva, where you are looking at water and sanitation, you're looking at disaster risk reduction, you're looking at human rights, trade. Until we make nature, until we make nature-based solutions or restoration a solution to a problem we will always be doing functioning on the margins of that big problem. So this is really um, an extension of a, an invite for a partnership, partnership for us to go beyond our own tight knit community and partnerships for you to be open to working with us, those of us working in the conservation sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Radhika. Um, over to you, Muson, a very short uh, take home message. I'll be very brief. As the book by Roman Krasnarek asks, are you a good ancestor? I think uh, future generations would judge us by what it is that we've left them behind. We have a duty now to leave something more meaningful and ecosystems that are intact, sustainable and really uh, life giving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Musunda. Pasang, over to you for a quick take home message. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcos. Uh, as I uh, as I highlighted in uh, earlier as well, that uh, threat of uh, indigenous people, the continuation of this uh, kind of uh, uh, conservation practices in by separating indigenous people from their homeland, from their ancestral domain, that is a really uh, scary part for many indigenous people around the world. That uh, not indigenous peoples will uh, face the similar uh, challenges of continuation of the traditional uh, governance system livelihood in the name of the expansion of the conservation projected by the post-biodiversity framework. 
So uh, but the main message here I would like to uh, focus on that uh, the legal recognition of our customary governance system that help to protect our knowledge and values and spiritual values that attach to the nature and people to be protected and preserved and uh, so that uh, uh, and, and make it as a basis for the nature based solution so that uh, our knowledge system, our values and culture will be continued by the future generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pasan. Oh, over to you, Nirma, for a quick yes, take home message. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we have proven that ecosystem restoration works. It works across terrestrial and marine and wetland domains, and it provides nature-based solutions to development partners, such as tourism and the blue economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last take home message over to you, Gilles. Uh, thank you very much, Marcos. I think we have to uh, empower the share of, back of best practices in NBS. We have to do it more and more and more and invest on young people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you. That's been very inspiring. And um, I go home quite energized with all of these amazing ideas. We are already two minutes over our time. I just want to remind you all that the next Nature Based Solutions Dialogue uh, will be the 28th of June, and it will be about the post 2020 global biodiversity framework and nature based solutions. Mm. With this, I want to thank you all. Thank you all for your participation and thank you for sharing those ideas, our dear panelists. And I wish you a very nice day and very nice week.